Well, good morning and God's morning to you, Apostle of the Future Peoples. We are going to jump into the Prophet's Dictionary and Eternity's Generals, kicking off with our Under the Microscope. Uh, welcome to this week's episode broadcast of Apostle of the Future, where we are uh, going to continue, and I always say what we're about to do, continue with the world when Christ was walking the planet, the world before Christ's cross. It's really important to understand that because if we don't understand our heritage, then we won't understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. If you don't know why somebody did something, then you won't know why you are assigned to do it a certain way or why they said to do it a certain way. So good morning to you all. And uh, hey, 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 good morning, Marsha, Marla, Denise. Okay, okay, you're on time and ready, very good. So you wanna make sure you have your dictionary today. You wanna make sure that you have your Eternities Generals and your notebooks because we are rolling into our subject matter. Go ahead and share this broadcast. Let the world know Apostle of the Future is on and we are taking on God's issues. That is what we do. Our chief apostle, Dr. Paula Price, taking it on with Paula Price. Uh, it is our job, and, and every broadcast we have in God's Royal Network does take on different issues in the kingdom, whether it's the soul issues with Prophet Maud and also Apostle Sally Cheney or uh, Mental Health Mondays with Maud and uh, Hidden Secrets in the Attic if we're dealing with our younger generation with Prophet Adia with Profiting This Generation or if we're taking on intercession with Prophet Angela if we're dealing with the body taking on our health with Dr. Larry McCullough there are so many things that we tap into and of course let us not forget the Prophet Circle which is going into every realm of society and in the kingdom dealing with things prophetically Wednesday Warriors and Before the Garden on Wednesday nights of course, Dr. Paula Price's show on Thursday and our apocalyptic series. This is an apocalyptic era that she is rolling out. So if you don't follow Apostle Paula Price on Facebook, that's who you need to be following because she is laying out God's next plan for where he is going with his church and the world and eternity. This isn't just a uh, the next you know, wave of, okay, what's God saying so we can slingo it and put it on t-shirts and throw it in books and market ourselves into the ground and then move on to the next wave. This is a new era. This is not just a wave or a wind of doctrine. This is God's new era and we have to be ready for that. And so uh, in, in doing so, our apocalyptics are really challenging us and encouraging us to take head on what God is dealing with. Christianity heretofore in this most recent dispensation has been quite passive as far as taking on issues, getting out there in front of situations, taking on government, taking on the education system. And the more we told people that's not where Christians belong, the more Satan put his people in. This is how we have abortion full term. This is how we have them teaching these insane things to our children in school. I will tell you what, probably one of the very few positive things coming out of the quarantine and all of this agenda playing out is it does put children back in the home. Now, not every home children should be in, and it's it's terrible, and it's sad. There's a lot of abuse, molestation. A lot of things are happening to kids in their homes anyway, and then being locked into those, locked in literally into your house, not a good thing for a lot of people, but for a lot more people, it is a good thing because parents are able to pull their kids out of the school system. I saw a survey where uh, more parents are considering keeping their children in the homeschooling or online schooling platform because the environment in school, public and private, is just off the charts. The, the temptations, the sexuality, you're talking about kids having to define in school their gender. What? Your sexuality. Why are we thinking about sex at five, four years old? What sex do you want to be? What? How do you even answer that at that age? You, you hardly even know what it even means other than which way you go to the bathroom. If you have siblings, oh, boys stand up and girls sit down. I mean, outside of that, your sexuality, your sex doesn't really factor into much. 
And today, our uh, under the microscope topic is term number 956 in the Prophet's Dictionary. You can see it is on the screen here, the term number, and we are going to address the term obscene. What does it mean, obscenities? Uh, obscenity is actually the next term, five, uh, 957, 957. But 956, first of all, just the notion that there are this many terms in this book is just, and one person put this together. Hmm. 956, obscene. Are you ready? Are you ready to go into today's subject matter? If so, let me know. If not, we're going anyway. Okay, here we are. Obscene means unchaste and immoral. Let me get my thing here. I'm going to, I love uh, doing term definitions here. So just so we're clear on what we're talking about. Okay, so if obscene means unchaste and immoral, chaste, C-H-A-S-T-E, chaste, means abstaining from extramarital or from all sexual intercourse. That's what it means to be chaste, abstaining from extramarital, uh, ha not having any sexual nature or intention without unnecessary ornamentation, simple or restrained. Okay, so, uh, so similar words are virginal, virgin, intact non-sexual. When we're talking about being chaste, it is being virginal and not just <coughs> technically a virgin. As in, I haven't gone all the way. However, the grocery list of things that you have done sexually is like, well, why haven't you just had, okay, sexual intercourse. And so uh, that's what chaste means. When God is coming back for a chaste body, a chaste church, it is devoid of, of sexual immor of sexuality. Not just sexual immorality, but sexuality here. Uh, sexual intercourse, extramarital sex. And now, if we take this and we tie it to what the Lord said over and over and over and over about his people, Israel. What did he always say? You are chasing other gods. You are yoking up with other gods. Uh, you are impure, immoral, chasing other gods. On and on and on and on and on it goes. We can see the connection when he's talking about a chaste church, when he's talking about that. So now let's take it further to where we are as a contemporary church. It thinking about um, what he said concerning, I'm sorry, not what he said, where we are as a church in our sexuality. How sexy can we be and still be in God, especially as leading women? Is it okay to have a little cleavage? It should be okay, right? Hey, you know, I mean, people should know that married couples still, Christian married couples still have sex lives. Yeah, uh, no, you should know you still have a sex life. All right. The people you counsel should know that. We can see it. Look, how many kids you yeah, walk around. There are many ways to know this without putting it out there. How sexy is too sexy? Are these, should they, uh, should they be able to wear this outfit? Well, they're going to a music award show, so they should be able to be sexy because that's the environment where that's appropriate. No, no, no. We don't, we don't handle ourselves according to the environment. It doesn't say that every man walks, and we talked about this the other week, every man walks in the name of their environment. No, you walk in the name of your God. So if you have a God that you serve that wants you to be, uh, nude and walking around showing yourself, then that lets us know who you serve. So this, uh, one of the first signs of something that is obscene is it is unchaste and immoral. It is very sexual in nature. It is immoral. Much of what we see today on television, in music, and in the church is very sexual, obscene. We think obscene is just somebody cussing. They were so obscene. They were actually probably really profane which is something else, although it might actually be in here as well. Unchaste and immoral. That which produces and promotes impurity. So something that is obscene, I love this, produces or promotes and promotes impurity. You will know them by their fruit is in scripture many times in whether said like that or the implication of it. Sins of the Father will be revisited upon the generation. So on and on, the, that even that concept is, is interwoven 
throughout scripture. So we have here that obscenities of something that is obscene produces and promotes impurity. We have on the planet right now probably the most impure generation. So if we look up the word pure, because this is how we study, and I'm just using my cell phone right now. Typically, it's much more involved than that. Pure means not mixed or adulterated with any other substance or material. So while we're promoting that we have the right to still listen to carnal music and we have the right to watch all of these nonsense on television and we have the right to go to clubs and we have the right to do all those things in Jesus, actually the pres uh, promoting impurity is obscene. When you're mixing, you're making something impure, even if it's producing something really yummy, right? So you have, when we make a cake, I like cake. You have sugar, pure form, flour, eggs, what? Baking soda, whatever else goes into a cake, and then whatever kind of cake you're making, all the extras. In its pure, those elements are pure until you mix them together to create something else. Now that something else happens to taste really good, but it's still mixed without any extraneous and unnecessary elements is pure. Free from any contamination. Free from any contamination. When we put ourselves in these environments and in these places, we are contaminating ourselves. And let's look up very quickly to adulterate. Because... There's a reason, let me see, okay, here's a basic definition of adulterate. You should really um, look it up and study it out, but it means to render something poorer in quality by adding another substance, typically an inferior one. Which is why the Lord didn't say don't have an affair. He said don't commit adultery. Because adultery is, is actually destroying your marriage as it was. And downgrading it and contaminating it with an outside substance. Meaning somebody else, their devils, their bodily fluids and their whole life. And then sometimes you're producing a child out of that. It can just run, run, run. So that's obscene, unchaste and immoral. That which produces and promotes impurity signifies a bad omen, a sign of the presence of evil forces and agents, spiritual and moral disfigurement caused by lewdness. That's letter D in that. Spiritual and moral disfigurement. Do you know that you can become disfigured in the spirit? Lewd. What is lewd? Because we need to know what words mean. Lewd. Crude and offensive in a sexual way. So we see that obscenity is largely tied to sexual, sexual immorality, sexual impurity, sexuality outside of the context for which God made it. The Lord does not have a problem with sex. He does not have a problem with you being sexual with your spouse. Outside of the marital institution, it is a problem. And it is a problem outside of that. Crude and offensive in a sexual way is lewd. So when you're talking about spiritual and moral disfigurement caused by lewdness is obscenity. Filth that bodes of evil omens, portentous and inauspicious. What hags old what hags and old witches <laughs> motivate? Old witches motivate obscenities. You know a church has witchcraft when it is obscene. We're calling it liberty, we're calling it freedom in Christ, we're calling it all these things, but the Lord says that it is obscene. It implies using the repulsive, repugnant, and disgusting as tools to outrage. Wow, wow, wow. I think I jumped ahead here. The offensive, injurious, and perverse. The filth that springs from hate and the abominable. Filth. Obscene means filth. We have dirty people. The word applied spiritually defines a, a deliberate attempt to offend accepted standards of morality, modesty, and decency with lewdness purposely to incite 
lustful passions and desires. So walking around in all of this skin tight, revealing clothes, I am shocked sometimes at what I see Christian parents allow their daughters to wear in public. I'm talking about young girls, teenagers, early college, 15, and they're all out and shoulders out, cleavage out, midriff out, booty out, legs out, all this talk about you cute, you cute. Um, that's lewd. That's sexual. First of all, it's kind of scary that you cannot recognize you are pimping your child as a sexual model. Sexuality. That's sexy. Should sexy be on your kids? And then you wonder why your kids have sex problems. We separate. You, we say we don't want our kids to be sexually engaging, sexually active, but especially, and, and I'm a woman, so I see more of young ladies, uh, and, and then we'll see these girls out there in all of this adult. There were things that were only for adults when I was a kid. If you saw a little girl, a young girl, a teenager walking around with all of this out, it was like, where are your parents? Who let you walk around like that? How can that happen? And now it's a rite of passage. My baby is an adult now. And so as an adult, she can show the world everything. It's scary and it's frightening because we open up our children to things they are not able to handle. They're not able to handle the consequences of a grown man stepping up to them as a young girl like she's a grown woman and him wanting to do grown woman things to her, to her and with her, not just to, not just with her to her and then throw her on the side of the road that old man he's so disgusting i can't believe he looked at my daughter i can't believe he touched her she's actually three quarters of the way naked we have to take responsibility in dealing as apostles of the future apostolic saints and christians take responsibility for what we are unleashing on our children as parents Ignorant parents, if you're that parent who was so mad that you had strict parents, anybody have the, the mother, the father who you're not going to go out looking like this and you're not going to do that. And so you, you're not going to be that parent. You're going to be the one who's liberal. You're going to be the one who understands your child. And you send them out there all uncovered, literally uncovered into a world, a different world than when you were a child. When even when I was a kid. It's in this, well, at this point, this is 40 years ago. It was nothing compared to what it is now. Now, it was certainly the big, the continuation of the previous generation. I'm not saying the previous generations were clean. We had the same trash and the same mess, but it wasn't so easily accessible. It, and it was not in your face the way it is now. So I'm not deluded into thinking there was a time when society was white, whitewashed and just totally pure. And now it isn't. No, no, no. But you, that was... That was hidden somewhere. You had to actually be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And more so than now being snatched up off of the street, somebody groping you. I mean, I've had people come up to me and touch me. Even when I was in college, in college, not here in Tulsa, in the school I was at before I came here, I had guys come up to me and put their hands where they didn't belong. And I was minding my business. I wasn't even off but I was in an environment that wasn't smart. And so that you that thing changes you. You're like, whoa, all of a sudden life gets really real when somebody reaches out and touches you when they shouldn't. And so we have our kids out there. This whole obscene spirit, this obscene devil talks to you. And it sounds like liberty. And it sounds like freedom. And it sounds like we're not going to be religious. And we're not going to be boxed in. And we're not going to do all those things. But guess what? It's a devil. And it's telling you that it's your idea to pimp your kids and to put them out there and to do anything that Satan can have access to them. I just challenge you, if you're a parent, to evaluate what message are you pushing and what do you actually believe? To our, This is just, I mean, how this is the word applied spiritually defines. I'm going to reread it. A deliberate attempt. See, obscenities are a deliberate attempt to offend accepted standards of morality, modesty, and decency. What has been under attack? Modesty and decency. People look at us around here, and you know what? When we go in public, 
today I stopped on my way into the office and a, a woman in a, in a, a store where I stopped in, she saw me get out of my car. She saw me go in and she was waiting on a friend. When they got there, they came in and she said, excuse me, what do you do on my way out? And I said, I'm a minister. And she said, oh, and she said, okay, because I just was looking at the way you were dressed and the way you carried yourself. And I knew that you had to do something. And then I told her whose church I went to, uh, and she she knew who Dr. Price was. She said, Dr. Price has a church in Bixby? I didn't know that. You know, it was a great, actually, outreach moment. But this thing is under such attack that when you see somebody looking modest and you see someone looking decent, they actually stand out. There was a time when that was the norm. That was the norm. You got dressed. My grandmother got dressed to go to the store, took a bath, did 10 layers of creams, put on her hair, did the whole nine, put on her shoes, stockings, tights. <clears throat> and we went to the grocery store. And now, bless God, we literally have people looking like we don't even know what. Going in public, saying that it's their right and it's their freedom. Sexually driven portrayals of the impure intended to defile and demoralize and promote pornography on behalf of a deity or in compliance with its rights of service and worship. That's where we are right now. Sexually driven portrayals of the impure. That's that all this television, these sex scenes, even in uh, regular TV shows, they may not have nudity, but folk are rolling around in the bed doing all kinds of things at, at hours where you're like, it's still really early. Why? Why is this, what show? Christians publicly promoting some of the most amoral Subject matter, television shows, but the acting is just so good. And the subject matter is so devilish. Devils. I always get concerned when I see Christians and ministers promoting and saying, Oh, my show's about to come back on. And I can't wait. And it is full of everything but the righteousness of God. I'm not talking about we can't watch television or something unless it is preachy. I'm not saying that at all. So please, please don't go down that street or that road but the the uh, spirit of obscenity and obscene ways of thinking are so pervasive according to the old testament the term was spawned and inspired by asherah or ashtaroth the phoenician goddess of sex war and fertility the filth and impurity produced by the obscene that equates to excrement and urine Adultery, excrement, and urine. Okay, that's what the filth and impurity produced by obscenities cause. So when you are obscene or when you're dealing with an obscene spirit, because sometimes we want to say, I just don't know what I'm wrestling with. I don't know what I'm fighting with. I don't know what's going on. And it's an obscene devil driving you to sexual immorality and and uh and lewdness and and perversion and all of that that is an obscene devil and i love uh, the filth and impurity produced by the obscene that equates to excrement and urine there is nothing redeemable about that you you cannot redeem waste other than to turn it into fertilizer so something else can grow and it better be the right kind of waste or else it's poison in the ground the wrong kind of waste in the ground kills everything the right kind of fertilizer waste fertilizes to reproduce. So we're not talking about that good kind. We're talking about toxic waste. That's why it's called toxic waste and not the other. Okay, so that was our under the microscope today. <laughs> we went in on the subject of obscene. Why are we talking about obscene? Because we are still dealing with the world before Christ's cross. We think and believe that because we are uh, redeemed and Jesus came and things are different and things are new, that somehow we are that somehow we are in a different paradigm. That sin is not the same. Oh, you don't understand. Life is different now. It's different from when Jesus came. You know, it was just no, no. It was terrible. It was awful. And so we're going to address today the world before Christ's cross. How much do we even think about that? The world before 
Christ's cross. Jesus walked in the world before his redemption kicked in. <laughs> we don't think of that. He came as the light of the world. So he came in a very dark time. He did. The starting apostles' apostles' message did not begin with church government because there was no church. The question that I challenge apostles with is the same question that Dr. Price, the type of question that Dr. Price challenges prophets with when she says, if you're not prophesying, what's a prophet to do? Well, if a prophet isn't, if an apostle isn't uh, governing the church, what are they doing? Right. We predate the church. It did not center on begetting sons and daughters because God's family was yet being born and those that were had a long way to go to shed their other God's roots and strongholds. See, what our doctrine has turned into and what actually was the focus when the Lord started this thing, two different things. This is why we're going back. You can see here, Eternity's Generals is on your screen. This is the book we are in. Apostolism did not preach traditional church doctrine because it was unfolding and formulating as an ongoing event. In regards to doctrine, the apostles had the monumental task of divesting Christ's gospel and doctrine from Judaism. They did not concentrate on transmitting what we have come to accept as the teachings of the apostolic fathers who were yet to be born or recognized. <clears throat> We're standing on the success of their work, not actually the work that they did. Now, that's what we're standing on, but we don't recognize that's what we're doing. What did exist during the early apostles' days were other gods, plenty of them. Going back to one of our key statements of eternity's generals, apostleship hinges on two immutable things, gods and nations. That theme runs all the way through scripture. The Lord talks about he will have his people. You will be my people. I will be your God. The land in which I have delivered you from, <coughs> the land in which I will send you back to. Gods and nations. Gods and nations. Gods and nations. What did exist was a world rifled with demonic activity, abuse, and devilish dominion. What did exist in the Lord's and his original apostles' world were witches, magicians, oracles, diviners, and fertility cults that religionized immorality and ritual fornication. So this is how it goes. Are you ready? Hey, Kamisha. Hey, Jamie. Thanks for tuning in. Are you ready? We're going to lean in and connect the dots. Or oh, maybe I'll have a segment called Connect the Dots sometimes. You know, I get excited with segments. <laughs> and so we're leaning in. When she said that uh, these guys religionized immorality and ritual fornication. What does that look like? What it looks like is when you join something spiritual, we're just going to say spiritual, everything attached to what they want you to do in that spirituality, they say is a part of being them. So when you, for example, join a fraternity or a sorority, we're going to pull it out of the realm of the church for just one minute. Is that okay? Is that okay, P.I.T. Norma? It's okay. We're going to pull it out of the realm of the church. We're going to bring it right home. Sororities and fraternities. Had this conversation last night with Dr. Price about something else. But, so you have rituals. You don't enter into a sorority or a fraternity without rituals at all. Usually you have to be invited. A senior member, unless you're legacy. If you're a legacy member, then it's automatic. Don't be legacy Delta and you want to join Theta. I'm sorry. Your mom was a Delta. Your auntie was a Delta. Your great grandmother was a Delta. You're going to be a Delta. See, we, you know, we only believe things when we want them, when we want to believe them. So if somebody says that your family was in ministry and then this person's in ministry or, or we're going to go to this church, I don't want, I don't believe, I don't do because it's God. But when it's something like frats and sororities, oh, well, it's my, I'm a legacy member. I have to do it. When I was in my first college, I had friends who struggled with where they were pledging because, now this is before I knew pledging was wrong, okay? Because I pledged. This is before I knew it was wrong. This is before I met Dr. Price. Okay, I've repented. I'm not. And and they they would have to go with the sorority 
or the fraternity in which was legacy in their family. Even though all of their friends were somewhere else, they fit in somewhere else. It did not matter because that is the family inheritance and heritage. With that comes rituals. You have your pledging rituals. I'm sorry, your rush rituals. What you do when you're rushing. And then when you become a pledge, what you do as a pledge, the rituals to prove you are worthy of the fraternity or sorority. That's what you do. Whether it's all the insane, hateful things the alcoholic beverage things, the sex things, the drug things. The one I was a part of was uh, very was not extreme in that area. I didn't drink. I didn't sex around. I didn't do any of those things. And anything that they had tied to it, I was exempt from. Hey, I was like, I don't need you. So if this is going to be a problem, I'm out. And it was not a problem, interestingly enough. Because when you stand by your convictions, people tend to honor that. Even if that's against all their rules, they'll say, okay, well, that's who you are and that's what you do. And so those rituals, that's tied to a God somewhere behind all of that. Because why? Those sororities are God and goddess names. Greek letters, Greek life, Greek gods. So they have religionized, okay, <coughs> because pledging and rushing is a very religious thing. You don't go to church, but I tell you what, folk are praying because if you, let's see here. Let me look this up real quick. Do, 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 do. Let me see. Hang tough saints. I'm just looking something up. Okay, so when we're talking about religious and religionizing, and we're talking about fraternities and sororities, okay, so the belief in and worship of a superhuman controlling power, especially a personal God or gods, a particular system of faith and worship. Something that is religious is a particular system of faith and worship. Whatever your faith is, whatever your worship is. So when we're talking about the fraternities and sororities and pledging, that is, that is just your official, that is their official structure, their system of faith. You believe in the brotherhood. Isn't that what it is, P.I.T. Norma? You believe in the sisterhood. It's, it's, a religious, it's a religious order. Don't get it twisted. It is a religious order. It is your system of faith and worship. You have faith in your sisters, faith in your brothers. You all come together. They break bread. They drink alcohol, all of that kind of stuff. That's their communion. When we have communion, it's under Jesus Christ, the bread, the wine, or, or the juice, or whatever you have to represent his body and his blood. There, it's eating whatever foods they have and drinking whatever drinks they have, the concoctions, the goblets, the punch bowls, all of that is religious. It's just not to Jesus Christ. Try and break the religious pattern and see what happens to you. Hazing, R rituals. What do they say? Well, it's a ritual. It's and, and a softer word for ritual is tradition. It's a tradition that we do this. It's a tradition that we do that. It's a tradition. It's religious. So they have religionized how you're going to pay homage to their gods, their rituals, their Greek gods. Because it's in a frat house or a sorority house, and everybody's wearing matching t-shirts and doing dances and poses and throwing up signs, doesn't mean it isn't any less about a God. In fact, it's just as much. Even more so. You can't throw that sign unless you belong to that sorority. You can't do that. You can't date him. You can't date somebody unless, you know, the brother or sister fraternities, okay, uh, these ones only date those ones and these ones only date from that one. I mean, the whole thing is tight. And we kill ourselves. People do to join. Because, hey, it's prestige. They'll tell you where you can go, where you can't go, who you can associate with, who you can't associate with, who you can marry, who you can't marry, what's going to kick, get you kicked out forever. You'll be banished if you do certain things. And the list goes on. 
religion. That's religious. And these are people who say, you can't make me go to church every Sunday. Ah! Because we're not that religious. We, we don't want to be that, you know, we're, we're too. Uh-huh. And you're somebody who's going to have placards on your walls bragging about your fraternity brothers. You're going to spend money on that reunion. Money you don't have. Won't give the church a thousand dollars in an offering. And we'll spend five thousand dollars on your reunion. Oh no, well, we have to get the this. No, we're gonna dance. So we have to get the suit and we have to get the hat and we have to get the cane and we have to fly into town and spend four days in the hotel and, and food and have to get the new clothes and the dresses that don't fit and try and pretend like we still a size two and we're twenty two and you on and on and on and go and to fulfill the fantasy, you have to buy things you can't afford for your ritual, for your religion. So do we believe in religion? Oh, yeah. We just don't want to be locked down in Jesus Christ. We want to be locked into the flesh because we want the prestige. We want to belong. We want you to understand because when I was going through, my brothers were with me. We're going to forsake our family for a sorority. Well, I thought you liked that guy. Well, I do. But you know what? My sisters told me that he's just not. He, I can't because he's not this or he's not that. The, the person who, who you're supposed to be with. Right. They call the shots. And if you are in one of those high, high, high level ones, oh, please. Your dues, the dues, the money you pay to wear those letters? Yes. Oh, yeah. You're broker than a joke. Can't hardly eat paying those dues. Can't afford anything. Buying those boots. Going to those parties. Going to the bars. Doing all of it, having the themes, having the dance, having the costumes. Insane. Insane. Nothing to do with your education. Nothing. Now, the high-level ones are going to see to it that you're smart and you get good grades because they don't want stupid people. They want wealthy people who will still give back into the sorority or fraternity after they've graduated. When they become the, the uh, legendary ones pouring back in. So we do believe in religion. So if you're one of those people who told God that you don't want to be yoked up in church every day, oh, I'm getting on my high horse right now. I feel myself mounting up on this horse. <laughs> if you're that person who is telling God, I don't know why we have to be in church this amount of time, no matter where you are, I'm not talking about just here in Tulsa. Uh, I don't understand why. Why do they always want me to be a part of every club? Why do they want me to be a part of this? Why do they want me to be a part of that? I just came here to go to church. I just want to be left alone. And you were that person who chased that old life. You owe God. You owe him. If you chase the devil harder than you're chasing God, you owe him. If you were an athlete and you were part of a team, oh, have mercy. Look, I was just in the band. In high school, <clears throat> and you have, you have to go down and do the, so you have, if you're an athlete, you have the trips, you have the exercise, the workout, the team this, the team that, on the road, buying this, buying that, all over the place to go for the championship, and then don't get in the championship round, and your life is owned. You're missing holidays, you're missing family time, you're missing everything, you're up all night studying because you still have to make the grade to stay on the team, and you're giving and giving and giving and giving four years, eight years, however many years, middle school, high school, college, post. And God says, I need you to do this, and you're like, oh, I don't know if I can do that. I mean, after all, I have a job. I have a dog. I have a family. <laughs> hey, look, some people use their dog as a reason. I have a family. Oh, so now... Because it's the Lord, those things that you use as a badge of honor somehow become a point of shame when it comes to God. So you're in church every day? You're giving God what? You're doing, huh? And on and on and on we go. Look, I've been in ministry a long time. As an adult, I've been in ministry for 20 years on some level not starting where I am now. And from then, uh, not so much now because, I mean, this is, you know, my career. But especially then, it was all about don't give too much to the Lord. Don't give too much to God, but don't give too much to the Lord. You need to give it to your education. You need to give it to your career. You need to give it to uh, starting a family. You need to give it to traveling the world and to having fun. For sure, having fun. That's the number one question. Well, what do you do to have fun? Do I look like I don't have fun? Any, what are I doing? I'm smiling. <laughs> Even as we're telling the devil off, we're smiling. What do you do to have fun? I'm just concerned that you're working too hard. 
And I'm thinking, uh, no, it trusts me. I know how to, I'm out. Anybody who knows me knows that though. No, no. I work hard while it is yet day. <laughs> I mean, for sure. We put in late nights when it's necessary. But if I knew how much I put in before ministry, <clears throat> I know the hours I put in for shows, memorizing lines, practicing songs, memorizing blocking, uh, doing costuming, stage makeup, rehearsals, 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 and then the practice outside of rehearsals, hours and hours, and going to church, and chasing my brother in sports, and doing all of the other things. I know what I put into being good there. I know what I did. And a lot of it was late nights, early mornings, running around half cross-eyed because, hey, we believed that this is what it takes. If you want to be the best, you have to do more than everybody else, then do more than the rest. If you want to be the best and on and on and on it goes. So when it comes to God, all of a sudden, because Satan has done such an amazing job, a smear campaign on downing what it, what uh, the, the value and the reward and the prestige of serving God. We've removed the prestige of serving the king. Will you serve and work for the highest person? I work for the highest person in our organization. It's a very prestigious position. It comes with a cost. But there are certain, there are definitely major rewards to the position. But we don't see that in serving God a lot of times. We see it as, well, just make sure. I have seen ministry destroy many families. No, what you've seen is uh, other things destroy many families that were in ministry. Some that shouldn't be together anyway. Was it the ministry that destroyed it or was it the mismanagement that destroyed it? I've read executive books. I have read so many, I, I have lost count. Listen to audio executive books and they all say the same thing. If your personal life falls apart, at the cost of your career, it's your fault. It is your fault. It is your fault. Don't blame your career for why your personal life fails. Blame you. No matter what that is, ministry or not, because the woman who wrote this was not a minister. She is not a Christian from what I can tell, but I tell you what, she said that, and she said it as a woman to women. Do not blame your life responsibilities for your husband not being happy at home. Don't blame your job for your kids being dissatisfied in your house, being a wreck. Do not blame your life. Take ownership and make it work. And so these other organizations have institutionalized, they've religionized, but because it is socially what we chase, we don't realize that we were religiously devoted to those things. Do you hear me religiously? Mom, I can't come home. I won't be home for Thanksgiving because we're going to be playing that day. We watch football game, Thanksgiving, Macy's Day Parade. Those people are not with their families. They're out working. <laughs> well, we're talking about what deserved time off. They're working. The, the, the people who are entertaining us are not with their families because they're entertaining us. The people are working in the television networks are working. So they religionized immorality and ritual fornication. Going back to sororities, fraternities, just as an example that we can all have an immediate connection to and say, oh, yeah, that's, that's true. Ritual, ritual sex in fraternities and sororities. Ritual sex. It's the ritual. End of the week, or uh, let me see, where I was on campus, there was a club on campus. And so it was open, I think, Wednesday nights and the weekends. And so... The ritual sex, the sex ritual was this. And at least with the ladies, because obviously I lived in a dorm with girls. And so they would, you would only hardly eat all day. So your stomach could be empty is what they would do. So that alcohol would hit your bloodstream fast. And you could get drunk really fast and not have to spend a lot of money. You want to talk about the devil is crafty. We think things through to destroy ourselves. That's why when you really want something, you make it work. So they would not eat. Oh, no, I don't want to eat. I don't want to eat. Plus, all those calories in liquor, they didn't want to eat and then have fat calories from, from the beer and whatever else they were drinking, depending on how broke they were, depending on if it was just a whole bunch of beer or if it was hard liquor. And so then that was the rituals. They would go and they start drinking and so they can get their buzz on and, and start getting drunk, getting ready doing hair, doing makeup. This is a sex ritual, okay? 
religionized immorality and ritual fornication. Right here. This is nothing new. And so they do it, and they, okay, 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 and how do I look? And they got the club clothes. All right. They have the ones that can be washed if they puke all over themselves, because half of them did. And then, did you talk to so-and-so? Is he going to be there? Is he going to be there? I don't know. Well, what am I going to say? What are you going to say? And then the scripting is mapped out. If we go out to the club and so-and-so talks to me, and if you see me walk off, just let me do it because I'm hoping that this guy. And so the whole thing is mapped out religiously every week because it's your faith system. It's your belief system. And then you go home with the guy and you do what you do, have sex with him, him and his friends, whatever. And then comes the walk of shame in the morning. You walking back from his dorm room or fraternity house to yours now i never see you know i wasn't made for that i'm not gonna be doing no walk of shame i'm not gonna i'm gonna say it improperly i'm not gonna be doing no walk of shame no 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 Ooh, you came and then it's all funny you get all half hair crazy eye makeup all over the place you're a hot mess you stink because the club stinks booze stinks sex stinks everything just smells and then you just nasty yeah but it was great it was good no it wasn't you don't even first of all you don't even remember what happened no no it wasn't it was terrible it was disgusting it was nasty and you're nasty go take a shower go take three showers and usually the shame is usually on the woman. You notice that we were doing the walk of shame, not the guys. You're going back to his place so he can be cool, chill, and laid out, passed out. And you have to walk around like a, a two-bit whore from one place to the next. Walk of shame. Hey, but hey, that's all right because that's their fertility cults that religionized immorality and ritual fornication. That's that right there. So if you say you don't believe in cults and you believe in fraternities and sororities, you do believe in cults. And you do believe in that fertility cult. This is what existed back then. This is what the Lord was dealing with back then. Yeah, Peggy, and they're so proud of it. Uh-huh. Yeah, tyranny, come on, never. I'm not, mm -mm, no, speaking straight facts. Yes, Vanessa, no, you don't even remember. These people, and see, I was always sober. I, I don't drink. I've never been drunk. I've had taste of alcohol a couple of times. Didn't even like it. I mean, really, honestly, I could tell that God made me for this, but he also knew I'm a very committed person. And once I start doing something, I'm all in. And I knew that at a young age. So a lot of times there were things I never started because I knew I would probably never want to stop. Walk of shame, it is true. The world of Christ's day was saturated with the occultic mysteries of seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. All of creation served as the props for religion, holy wars, and ritual perversion. These the apostles of old confronted. This is our job as apostles to confront these issues. So if you're thinking, how come you all can't let these things go? Why are you always talking about this? Why are you always talking about that? How come Dr. Price is always harping on this? Because that is actually the apostles' job and the prophets, actually, as well. All of creation served as, oh yes, okay, these, all right, now let's see, they were well versed in the monarchs that claimed divine prerogatives and the priests of pagan high places and the damnable pantheon of deities taking credit for creation and its offspring. Nothing has changed. The only enemy the apostles knew was Satan, his sway, his lies, and his bloodthirsty offspring, which served as their ministry targets and objects of conflict. Their target groups, however, did not know him as evil as he was. To them, he was an adversary and prince and prince of devils. But were devils all bad? They were not convinced. So we're, we're still in the same thing now. Are we not in the same thing now? Do we not have the same arguments now? Oh, how much sin is too sin? Well, we could just take a little bit in and it'll be okay. Um, I wanted to know this. Oh, let's say we could just really do that. Eh, it's going to be okay. And we still try and skate the line. How far out of the lines can we go and still be in? How much sin can we take in and still allow the Lord to carry us over to the other side? How much can we get involved in and the Lord's still going to understand? I'm his son, I'm his daughter, and I'm trying my best. And you know what? Sometimes that is true. But if you are not actually leaning on him, 
I would say for uh, many of us, you need to go in and break covenant with the old. But this is a good opportunity to repent because if you're one of those people who fusses about your godly responsibilities, I'm just going to say godly because you may not be a minister, but godly requests and responsibilities, but you were highly involved and yoked up in something else, it's time to repent. It's time to repent and tell God, you know what, Lord? Forgive me for doing this to you and then turn around, change your attitude and do a 180. And be wholly involved and be thankful for it. This man laid down his life. I mean, can you imagine? It's it would be like I mean, this is this is not even really close to an example, but uh, you know, when somebody receives a, an organ as a transplant recipient, before they do, they have to be tested. They have to know that um, those doctors have to know that they are going to be responsible for the organ that is about to be entrusted to them. Cannot have drugs in their system and have to be clean. If they were a drug addict, they have to be clean for an extended amount of time. And that's still a very high risk on their part. And you have to run through all of it. Can you imagine being the loved one of somebody who died and their heart or organ went to somebody else and you saw that person drinking and smoking and totally wrecking their body? You would be crushed saying, but my loved one is dead. And you have their organ or organs and you are treating it like trash. This is how we treat the Lord. This man died for us. Died. Jesus intentionally. It was not a hit and run. It was not some kind of accident. It was not, uh, what's it called? Manslaughter. This was, I am going to die for you. So you can choose life and life everlasting. And what do we do? We smoke it up. <laughs> we sex it away. Drink it down. Decide if we want to be that involved in church. This man laid down, shed his good pure blood. Mm. Went straight to hell. Did not pass go. And fought devils and everything else that he had to do. Man, is she laying this out in the apocalyptic revelation. And then came back. And brought us with him. And we're wondering if we should have to be in church two days a week. Do we have to have back to the basics? Do we have to come to this? Do we have to be in Sunday school? Do we have to show up to prayer? I mean, oh my goodness, there are just so many things. And I have a life. You wouldn't have this life without Jesus. We have this life without Jesus Christ. That's like people who get married and they're in shock that their spouse wants them to be a spouse. Oh, so you you want to you want to spend your day off with your husband? Uh, yeah. Really? Or the the vice versa? Well, my husband wants me to spend time with him. Uh huh. Yeah, and and I'm not talking about in that sick sort of like we didn't even know what kind of way, uh, but in the healthy, this should be expected of you. You have to clean this house. Oh my, and then have you met people who got married and realized they really didn't want to be married? <laughs> they just didn't want to have an empty bed, but they really didn't want to have a spouse. That's how we act with God. Well, I really don't want a, a savior. I just don't want to go to hell. I mean, I don't want to have to be responsible for anything here. I just wanted to say a few words and, and when I feel like cozying up to you, cozying up to you, but when I want to go hang with my friends still acting single, like I don't have a God to serve, I'm going to do that. And then when I need something, I'm going to come back to you and maybe I'll answer the phone when you call and maybe I won't and, and maybe I'll uh, hang out with you on my day off and maybe I won't. And we're about as fickle as the world can be when it comes to the Lord. But I want to remind you, this man shed his perfect blood some of us won't give somebody a ride across town six days in a row this man died died a terrible horrible brutal death his godhood did not anesthetize his body he felt it he felt it go back and watch the passion of the christ my god if you can make it through it because it was brutal and we're so cavalier and so dismissive and so whatever about God and the Lord. And if I have time and let me see and let me go pray and let me on the basics. I'm talking about the basics. I'm not talking about a career change here. Okay. I'm talking about the basics of 
a good relationship with the Lord. And we don't do that. We don't want to do that for him. We need to repent. <laughs> I'm so serious. We need to repent. Have a real moment where we clean it up with the Lord. Because how in the world are we going to bring back his church when we are a part of the problem? How are we going to do it? How are we really going to convince people that they owe God their life? Somebody ever save your life? You, you see, we just don't realize how much God saved us from. Sometimes we do and then we forget because life in him is so good. But if somebody, if a car is coming and it veers off and they snatch you out of harm's way, you say you saved my life. I owe you is what you say. And you walk around and you will dismiss your family to go help that person who saved your life. And they'll say, oh, I don't know. You don't have, no, no, no. You don't understand. You say my life and I will be, I, I owe you forever because of it. How much more do we owe God? How much more? I'm going to go back and repent myself. Look, because there are things that we all have there. There, are, you know, he is knocking. I need you to do this for me. I want you to do this for me. And then we busy ourselves sometimes with something else to say that whenever my schedule clears up, I'll do this. But that's this thing over here is not what God called you to do. It's this over here. And it just goes on and on. Listen, my giving information is up on the screen. My web address has been on the bottom. If you want to visit, check it out. This weekend, I'm going to be uh, doing some revamps and upgrades to uh, highlight new, well, new services, old services, new platform with Prophetic Ed. We are rolling it out. I'm going to have my interview up there as well as far as the services that I offer as an advisor and a coach. I'm not talking about just giving you a prophecy. I'm talking about what we what we do, what I do as an advisor, as an apostle in your life. Uh, one of the things that I say is I lay the ax to the root of what is preventing you from being successful. And that can be in God, in your job, in your family, in your right mind. Apostles are soul curers and bodily. You know, if God's moving through the hands and God's moving through the word, he can heal in that body. But to heal that soul. I want to thank you for joining me today. And I want you to share this. I know many of you do share this broadcast because these kinds of messages should not stay with where we are. We have to get it right with God. We have to fix it because we broke it. Even if we were born into it too young, we were kids. It doesn't matter. We are not children now. Thank you for tuning in and I will see you. Uh, let me see next Wednesday for Apostle of the Future. Hey, Sunday is my birthday. I'm so excited. You know, it's fun to be a preacher, a minister, and have a birthday on a Sunday. It just is more fun because you celebrate with the people you love, even if even if you're doing church as normal and nothing in particular really happens, but it's just a great time. And so thank you all. And I love Sunday birthdays because you kind of celebrate for two weeks because Sunday for some people is the end of one week. It's the beginning of another. It just depends. Hey, and I like to celebrate for a month. My mother is probably laughing right now because she knows that's true. All right. God bless you all. See you soon.